In Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, we read that after the work of creation in the first six days, God rested or refrained from any other work on that seventh day. God had previously surveyed all that He had done and pronounced it as being good. On the seventh day, He refrained from activity, and I repeat, He refrained from activity and pronounced the day or time spent refraining from work as also being a good and blessed thing. I repeat that again, just in case you didn't. The day that he refrained from doing, some, and oh, I could name some names right here. On the day that he refrained from doing anything, he also pronounced that day as being blessed, as being very good. And so in Genesis, God begins not only the cycle of dark and light, but also the cycle of work and rest on a regular basis, thus blessing both the days of work and the days of rest. You know, God has always recognized the need for a balance of work and rest, and not only for man, but for all of creation in order to achieve and maintain vitality. We read, for example, in Leviticus chapter 25, if you want to read along in your Bibles, beginning in verse two. Leviticus 25, verse two, the idea of incorporating into a normal life, a period of rest, not only for men, but for all of creation. We read, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I shall give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Your harvests after growth you shall not reap and your grapes of untrimmed vines you shall not gather, the land shall have a sabbatical year. All of you shall have the Sabbath products of the land for food, yourself and your male and female slaves, and your hired man and your foreign resident, those who live as aliens with you. Even your cattle and the animals that are in your land shall have all its crops to eat. So today, in our day of two career families, or people who are forced to work overtime, weekends, in order to keep pace with the job, it's easy to forget to take a break, to plan for regular rest from our work in order to renew and re-energize ourselves. You know, it's interesting to note that the term recreation comes from the words Recreate to create anew. Now, I'm saying all of this to remind us and to encourage us with the idea that holidays and vacations are things which are blessed by God and part of His plan for a person's total spiritual, emotional, and physical well-being. It's okay to take a vacation, amen? amen. Oh, pretty weak group. I think by, just by that amen, y'all need a vacation. Amen? amen? Oh, we're coming to life. You know, to feel guilty for taking the time to read a book, not a book that has to do with your work or a manual or you know, a, a, a book about how to become a better Christian. You never thought you'd hear the preacher say something like that. Just a book, just a book, just a diversion to feel guilty for taking the time to read a book, go for a walk, not a jog, not a program, just to go for a walk, or leave for a trip just to get away from it all. This is not a sign of godlessness. It's probably a sign of weak faith, and it's a sure sign that you really do need to take a break if you feel guilty every time you have a little time off. 
So as we're into the summer, you know, when I was planning this sermon, you know, it was sunny, it was warm, you know, I figured, oh yeah, this is the time to do it, and then it snowed, so uh, that's Oklahoma. So as we are into the summer, the nice weather is coming, and a lot of us are planning on our holidays, I want to encourage you to do so with God's blessings. And I also want to give you a few reminders of what to pack when you do go on summer vacation. That's why this sermon is entitled, What to Pack for Your Summer Vacation. So here are a couple of things that you need to pack for that summer vacation. Number one, I want you to pack holiness. Pack holiness, put that in your suitcase. You know, there's something about the sun and the sand and the strange places that seems to lower our inhibitions about things. You know, when the Israelites had a time of rest from their travels in the desert and they awaited Moses' return from the mountain, they went back to their former behavior of idolatry and revelry. We read in Exodus 32 in verse one, it says, now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Then if you skip down to verse five, it says, now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. We're going to party. It's rest time. It's vacation time. And watch what it says in verse six. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. And I'm not talking volleyball here. They rose up to play in an immoral way. Now you need to realize that this episode took place after they had seen the miracles that released them from Egyptian bondage. They did this after they had been saved from Egypt. They did this after they had publicly reaffirmed that they would obey and follow the Lord. But they had time on their hands. They had a vacation that lasted several weeks and they forgot about remaining holy. You know, we sometimes think that changing scenery or changing routines means that it changes who we are. And we are the holy ones of God. That's who we are. Changing our surroundings, changing our routine does not change who we are. I guess what I'm saying here is that the freedom that we experience at vacation time shouldn't be misunderstood as being freedom from being holy and conducting ourselves in a holy way. Whether you're in Oklahoma City or Hawaii or Barbados or London or France, you are always the holy one of God. You know, in very practical terms, that means being careful what we permit ourselves to do or see while we are on vacation. Let's not be involved in activities and entertainment that we would not do at home or we would not do in the company of other Christians. You know, being careful how we are seen. Summer is not an excuse to shed our clothes or shed our morals. There's a way to enjoy the beach and summer fun without being immodest or provoking others to lust or to wonder if we really are Christians. Let's not let the sun up in the sky remove the sun who is in our hearts. Christians are holy in their behavior and in their speech no matter where they are, whether they are at work or church or on the beach. So make sure you pack holiness with you on your vacation. Number two, I want you to pack faithfulness for your trip. Faithfulness. You know, one of the best ways to determine if Christianity only takes up a part of your life 
or if Christianity is your life, is how you plan to remain faithful to the basic things while you're taking time off, while you're on vacation. You know, vacations are a true test of one's commitment and maturity in the area of worship, for example, or service to the Lord. A vacation is not a time away from God. Do we actually think that? I'm on vacation, you know, I mean, uh, suspended. We're suspending our God stuff for a couple of weeks. That's not how it works. It's a time to be away from the regular way that you do things, and it's a chance to do new things. Well, you know, we still eat, but we eat differently. We still sleep, but perhaps we sleep a little bit more. We still do things, but we do things that we choose to do, and those things which don't usually require work from us. We still worship, but perhaps we worship with different people in a different place. These are things you do when you leave to, or there are things to do rather, when you leave uh, to, uh, to keep your home safe, right? To keep your home in order. You, you have somebody, hey, pick up my mail, make sure there's no you know, newspapers, a pile of newspapers at the, at the door, and would you come in and could you keep my dog or my cat? Uh, 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 would you come in and water my, you know, you take care of your business while you're, while you're gone, knowing you'll be gone. Well, in the same way, there are things to do when you leave to keep your spiritual home in order as well. For example, how about notifying somebody at the office that you'll be away for a couple of weeks or a month so we'll know that you're just out of town and you're not ill? Because you're not here, you're not at Bible class, something, you're not, doing, you're not teaching your whatever, and you know, the elders are starting to think, well, wait a minute, are they ill? Has something happened? Maybe we need to get in touch with them, find out if we can be of service, and then come to find out, oh no, I just, we went to the cabin for a month. Oh, it's been nice of you. Let us know. You're family, we're family. And how about arranging a replacement for yourself if you teach a class or you're a coordinator in a class or you, you, you're scheduled to serve on the table or you're part of a group project or whatever. Uh, so that we can replace you or you can replace, you know, they're simple things. Just reminders, taking care of your spiritual stuff before you leave. And make plans and prepare how and where you're going to worship while you're traveling. This will be a new experience and usually a very rewarding experience. I think one of the, the great things about being away from home is, uh, Lisa and I, when we're traveling, is to get a chance to worship with a, a different congregation. We get to see how they do things. I always pick up some great ideas, you know, how to improve things. We meet new people. We find out that people in other states or in even in other countries are just as fervent. They love the Lord. They want to do the right thing. They're preaching the gospel. It's such an edifying and encouraging thing to worship with other saints in other places. And the further away and the more different the culture, the more edifying it is for us as individuals, but you have to plan for that. You, 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 don't, you don't fly to London and on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. start thinking, well, I wonder where the church is here in the city of 12 million people. You know, you, you book ahead. You wouldn't think of going to London without booking your hotel, would you? You know, the office has directories, national and international directories for the Churches of Christ all over the world, and they are all over the world. We can find you a place where you can uh, worship with the saints. It, it's a great experience, but you have to plan for something like that. We encourage you to do that. And then, of course, remember your financial obligations to the church. Believe it or not, the bills still have to be paid while you're gone. You know, I always encourage people, do not use God's money to go on your vacation. That's just not a good thing to do. It's not a very wise spiritual move on your, on your part. Make arrangements to leave your offering with someone or make it up when you return. You wouldn't think of using your mortgage payment to pay for your trip, would you? Hey, what do you say? Well, just skip two months of the mortgage payment. I'm sure Bank of Oklahoma will understand. I don't think so. I don't think so. Why would we think any less of our commitment to God? We will keep our commitment with ONG 
uh, uh, we will keep our commitment with the bank, we'll keep our commitment with the newspaper to continue paying for our newspaper subscription while we're gone, why would we not give the same attention to our commitment to the Lord in that area? Certainly it's equal, if not more important. Now the original reason for the Sabbath rest was for man to take a break from his work and draw back closer to be with God. Remember, during your period of rest to make time for prayer and Bible reading and worship so that you also can renew your relationship with the Father. You know, bring your Bible with you. That, the worst thing in the world is you leave your Bible at home, bring your Bible with you. You're going to have some period of time there finally to be able to just sit down and say, you know what, on my vacation I'm planning on reading through the four Gospels, or I'm going to read the book of Romans, or I'm going to do the Psalms. You know, what a wonderful, refreshing, spiritual exercise and done in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where you're not in a hurry where no one's pressuring you. So on your vacation, pack holiness, pack faithfulness, and then one more thing, pack love. Make sure there's some love in there, in that suitcase. You know, there's something about the anonymity uh, that holidays provide that tends to encourage selfishness at times. You know, it's vacation time, we deserve it, and no better, nobody better interfere with our fun. We don't want to be inconvenienced by any type of service. This attitude guarantees that we may have some fun during our holiday, but we will come home unsatisfied, not refreshed. It's the spirit that refreshes us, not going to Disneyland. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive in Acts 20, 35. This passage reminds us that the true blessings come when we give of ourselves, not when we focus on receiving. And this principle holds true even when we're on vacation. We don't suspend that idea just because we leave town for a couple of weeks. So remember to pack enough love for everybody when you leave on vacation. Pack enough love for the family. Vacations are a time to draw close to our families and take the time to rebuild relationships, not hide behind a book or sunglasses. And make sure you pack enough love for the lost. There's no convenient season to hear or to respond to the gospel. Vacations bring opportunities to meet and sometimes share your faith with new people. Because when you're here, you're always seeing kind of the same people all the time. Same people at church, same people at work, same people, you know, your circle is pretty much the same. So the opportunities to share your faith with brand new people is, is much less. But when you go on vacation, they're all new people. All new opportunities to let people know that you're a Christian. All new opportunities to confess your faith before, before others. So don't pass up the chance to share your faith just because you're on vacation. You know, Jesus might return before you do. And wouldn't you be glad to still be confessing His name Amen. at a new place? And then finally, bring enough love for yourself. Some people hate vacations. They feel guilty about taking time off or spending money on holidays. These are the people at the other end of the spectrum who are always busy serving and helping and working. No time for rest. Rest, that's for wimps. But Jesus said that we need to love God, we need to love our neighbor, and we need to love ourselves in order to fulfill God's will. Taking a vacation and doing ourselves some good, having some fun, taking it easy, this is a perfectly honest and righteous way of loving ourselves in order to keep each part of this command in proper balance. You cannot keep loving others if at some point you're not loving yourself as well. That's how we manage to keep that in balance. So if you want to come back having loved your vacation, You've got to bring love with you on your vacation. Well, I hope you all have the opportunity to have some sort of holiday this summer and have a chance to go somewhere different, perhaps see family, visit new places. 
I just wanted to remind you to take Jesus with you no matter where or how you choose to spend your vacation. There's one more thing that you need to pack if you haven't already done so, and that is assurance that you are right with God before you leave. You know, people wouldn't think of leaving without accident or theft insurance in case something would happen on the road, because you never know, right? Would you think of renting a, an automobile, you know, you're at Hertz or Avis or whatever, you're renting a car, and would you think of not having any personal insurance and not taking out any insurance on the car in case somebody hit you or you had an accident and you're in a foreign place? No, you, you wouldn't think of doing that. Imagine, imagine not insuring your car, your camera, your life. Imagine the other side. Imagine insuring your car, insuring your camera, insuring your medical bills, but not insuring your soul. Imagine leaving your soul to chance, but insuring your car. In the middle of a good time, God could require your soul. And if He did, would you be ready? There's no law that says nothing bad happens on a vacation. There's no rule that says, oh, God's not a, God is not going to come for you while you're having fun. There's no rule that says that. So make sure that you have obeyed the gospel. You have repented and changed your life. You have confessed your belief that Jesus is the Son of God. You have obeyed the command to be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins so that God can place His Holy Spirit within you. Make sure that you have done that and make sure that you've been restored if you've not been faithful if you are a Christian who has fallen into habitual sin and need to be restored, make sure you take care of that. If you need to pack these last things before you leave, then I encourage you to do it now. Because as I said, you might not come back from that vacation. Make sure that you are all packed and ready to go either to Florida or to heaven, whichever one the Lord calls you to. I encourage you to make those decisions and pack those things as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.